Hey guys, welcome back. Thank you for joining Giant Nomad Presents. And today we have a veteran as well. His name is Clint. Welcome, Clint. Thank you for having me on, Johnny. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, get to know you and, and speak to your audience. So thank you again for having me on. No, awesome. Why don't you uh, give folks a little uh, uh, history about yourself a little bit. Introduce okay. yourself. All right. All right. So uh, again, just to reiterate what Johnny was saying, my name is Clint Berry. I grew up, born and raised from Plymouth, Minnesota, a uh, suburb town up in Minnesota. So I'm from the north, from the cold weather of Minnesota, which, you know, is a, I loved it growing up. I loved being in the snow, you know, six right. months out of the year. Uh, Minnesota just brought a lot of good memories to my childhood. I, I grew up a fairly normal life. Um uh, my parents gave me pretty much everything that I could possibly ask for. I grew up in a pretty wealthy part of town. My parents weren't the wealthiest, but it was a wealthy school that I went to. You know, my one of my friends, his dad owned a bunch of McDonald's chains and he was getting new cars when he was 16 and things like that. So I was around wealth at an early age, not so much entrepreneurship, but I was I was around wealth. I saw my my friends' parents doing extremely well. And just to kind of give you a little bit of backstory of like, you know, who who I was, I was a lost kid. You know, I think okay. maybe some people listening to this right now might feel lost as well. And I was putting my validation, my self-worth in other people's opinions of me. I was always seeking attention from other people, from validation from other people. You know, I saw the cool kids at my school were doing drugs and drinking at parties and that's what the girls like so that's kind of what I started to resort to about halfway through my junior year of high school I started drinking with my friends a couple weeks later I was smoking weed and a couple months after that I was dealing marijuana and then a year after I first started drinking I was in rehab halfway through my senior year I found myself in Hazleton inpatient rehab facility in Minnesota I think it was in Maple Grove Minnesota Okay. Um, I was in Hazleton for drug and alcohol abuse. Now, mind you, I don't think the addiction had blossomed that that much. My parents kind of found me with a bunch of weed and stuff like that, and they kind of freaked out a little bit and placed me in inpatient rehab. But honestly, at that point in my life, halfway through my senior year in high school, I was okay with it. I had a big uh, senior project that I was working on that I was extremely behind on. So it took me away from that. I got to go to rehab. And I was there for 30 days. I got food. I got to exercise. I was away from my my friends. I was just kind of isolated, right? And I, and I think rehab is one of those experiences that's just so – it's such a blessing because I got to focus on myself for 30 days straight. It's like when, when other do you get a chance um, to focus on nothing but yourself, be in a group setting, have therapists kind of walk you through how to – um, communicate better with others as well as yourself, how to self-love, how to forgive, how to move on, things like that. All of these things I was learning at a very early age, that being 18. I had just turned 18 while I was in rehab. But I remember I spent Christmas in rehab, and that was a, a, an interesting time because my parents came and visited me on, I believe, Christmas Day. And just to kind of see the look in their eyes, they were happy that I was getting help, but at the same time, they were kind of disappointed at you know, where I was in life, you know, they kind of had expectations of where they wanted me to be. Okay. So I learned a prayer in rehab. I'm not sure, Johnny, have you ever heard of the serenity prayer? I have not. No. Okay. This one sentence has absolutely changed my life. It's called the serenity prayer. It's passed along throughout the, you know, rehab and, um, addict community kind of, and it goes, um, God or higher power, whatever it is that you believe in, I'm not here to preach, you know, one thing over the other, but it says, you know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So it's a very short prayer, right? And that one prayer, that one sentence has had such an impact on me throughout my development into who I am and who I'm becoming in the future. And if we break down that one sentence, you know, grant me the serenity, you know, like clean, like clear state of mind, serene, you know, thoughts, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. I can't change anything outside of myself. Really, I can't change you, Johnny. I can't change the audience. I can't change 
you know, the people that are cutting me off in traffic or the cashier that gives me a hard time at the store or what the kids are doing or, you know, you know, I can't change anything outside of myself. Right. So I need to have the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, realizing that that's out of my control, the courage to change the things I can't. Now, it takes a lot of courage to go within and especially Johnny, are you familiar with the law of attraction? I know. Yes, uh, I am. OK, so the law of attraction basically states that, you know, we are constantly vibrating and like vibration attracts like vibration. So the courage to change the things I can, it takes a lot of. The law of attraction basically states that everything that you have in your life is there because you attracted it into your life, the good and the bad. So that takes kind of, it's kind of like a hard pill to swallow to take extreme ownership of your life in the sense that no matter what's in your life, good or bad, is there because you attracted it there. Because I attracted it there. I'll say I because I'm talking about me at this point. But I attracted things into my life and I need to take responsibility for that attraction. Why? What did I do to attract that into my life and what can I do to move forward from it so that it takes courage to kind of change the things that we can thus being you know how we're reacting to the environment and the situations that life is handing us and you know making it the best possible situation or letting it become negative does that make sense? Am I explaining that properly? No, yeah, absolutely. I, I law of attraction. I totally believe in it. I think I'm using it right now. That's how I bumped into you, right? Yeah. Um, it's 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 a force you really can't explain. It's it's a feeling that you have that you that you tend to. It's it, it's not a meditation state, but it's something that you continue to work at. That to your point, whether it's positive or negative, you know. Um, it can affect you in a great deal in a positive or negative way. So if you're in the underworld and and, and gangs or, or, or mobs, then you're gonna attract yourself to those type of people even more. And right. you get to you get to um even like with addiction like yourself and you get to know how the business works in that negative way. And right. if you're in a positive aspect, then definitely then you're gonna uh, attract more positive people you know, uh, people that can probably email uplift you, mentors, you name it, you know, it's, it's going to be wide open for you in either direction. Yes. No, I couldn't agree more. You know, what we think about most of the time is what we attract into our lives. That's Earl Nightingale, 1954, The Strangest Secret, you know, which is a fantastic recording. It's free on YouTube for the audience that's listening that wants to check it out. The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale on YouTube. Fantastic. Kind of talks about the law of attraction, but... Back to the serenity prayer, you know, the courage to change the things I can, right? And then the wisdom to know the difference, the wisdom to constantly know what I can, what I can control, which is myself, and what I can't control, which is everything outside of myself. That's a very powerful truth, right? That it, that's kind of illustrated in many different um, self improvement books and from leaders in the industry of personal development and things like that. Just throughout my studies alone. I've came across that simple truth time and time again, and it's just expressed differently through different um, people's kind of interpretation of the same message. But I came out of rehab, right? I ended up finishing high school at a sober high school in Edina, which was about, you know, 20 minutes away from my house. So I didn't even finish high school with the class that I started with. However, I did get to walk at graduation, which was my first time seeing all of my friends and acquaintances that I had known at, at my high school for the first time. I saw them for the first time after like five months and everyone was just kind of shocked that I show up to graduation. Cause I mean, it's like, imagine you go to school with a kid, you know, and all of a sudden one day he just disappears right before winter break. Right. And he, right. you just don't, you just don't see that person for, you know, the next four or five months. And then he shows up again or she shows up again and walks with the class. It's like, what the heck? Where did you, where did you go? Where did you, right. where did, you know, so that was an interesting experience. And then kind of watching all of my friends um, leave and go to college, all of them pretty much got accepted into college. And here I was kind of at a crossroads in my life, just came out of rehab, didn't really know what I wanted to do if I wanted to go to school. Never. I don't know if I'm speaking, you know, from a personal experience. I never really fit into school. I know there's a lot of people out there that may be listening to this that doesn't really feel like they fit in school as well. And I, I'm here to basically say, you know, it's OK, because I think schooling is kind of I, I don't have anything against learning. I think learning is great. Okay. I try to read on a daily basis and I'm constantly feeding my mind, you know, material. But what they teach in school, it's kind of like, 
You know, we all have different gifts. We all have different talents, um, characteristic traits that are special and individualized to who we are. And it's like the schooling system doesn't necessarily bring out those talents and gifts that I think we're meant to share with the world. So um, I, I decided not to go to college and picked up a job at a local country club, at which point I got back into drugs and I found myself in rehab a second time in under a year. This time I went in with so, intention. So go under ahead. a year. So let me ask you about the first time. So were you willing to go the first time or did your parents force you? Were you did you realize you had a problem? Great question. So what happened the first time is my parents caught me. I was under 18 at the time. However, my birthday was like that week. And I went through the process. My parents pulled me from school. I had to talk to a counselor at the rehab facility. Basically, she was checking to see if I had an addiction. And by checking, I'm, she was asking me like how many times I was smoking per day, per week, how, much, how many times I was drinking, things like that to kind of see if I had an addiction. At which point, obviously, it's a it's a it's a business, right? So they want more people in the rehab facility. So I was told that I had an addiction, which I agree with now looking back on. However, you know, I think that rehab probably wasn't necessary. But anyways, I got into rehab, right? I turned 18 and they told me that I had the option to check out. However, I knew that if I checked out of rehab, I would go back home. I'd have to go back to school. I have to finish that senior project. So a big reason for me staying into rehab the first time was to basically get out of that senior project, which it wasn't for you to really get clean. It was just to avoid. Exactly. Yeah. I didn't even I didn't even think I had a problem. You know, here I was an 18 year old kid halfway through my senior year. I was smoking every single night. You know, I wasn't really happy. I didn't have much happiness. I was like I said, I was seeking attention of people that didn't really care about me. They didn't they didn't they didn't really care if I was, you know, successful or whatnot. But um yeah, so I basically just decided to stay in rehab just so I could get out of that senior project. Wow. So I get out in December of 2011, I'm sorry, 2010, and then I'm back in rehab by December of 2011, a couple months after I had graduated high school. So I go back into rehab, this time for worse addiction. I got into pills because people, the first time I was in rehab, I learned about a bunch of drugs that I wasn't doing. And so I, I got into pills, I got into a deeper addiction, and that one almost cost me my life. Um, that was a, that was a scary that was a scary road to travel down. And what, up, what made you go to the pills? I mean, obviously you know, you see you got informed, but when you came out, like what what was your lifestyle that got you there? Great question. So the thing with marijuana, the thing with smoking weed so often was that a lot of the time, a lot of people can say that they smoke marijuana and it, they say that it relaxes them. It takes them out of paranoia. It calms them down. For me, when I was smoking weed, I was getting more paranoid. I was getting more anxiety. And so when I went to rehab and people started telling me about like these pills that you can just take and it just takes away your emotions which is ultimately what I wanted. I was just an insecure kid. I had acne all over my face. I had severe anxiety. I would wear sweatpants and sweatshirts to school every single day because I didn't like my body. I was such a shy and introverted kid. I, when I would talk to a girl, I would start to profusely sweat. Like not just like regular sweat, like to the point where I'd, it'd be, I'd be sweating through a sweatshirt. I remember wow. I had a, a navy blue North Carolina sweatshirt. And I would wear it to school, and by the end of the day, it would have armpit stains because of how bad I was sweating. And it wasn't from the heat. It wasn't from the temperature. It was from my anxiety. I was living in, in a future that never existed. I was constantly asking myself, like, what's the worst thing that can happen? The teacher calls on me to go up and answer a question. I walk up there. My pants fall down, or I trip in front of the class, or I do something embarrassing. Right? I had severe anxiety severe anxiety. And that's because I was constantly living in the future, a future that was just created in my mind. It, it, it was non-existent. However, that's where I was living. So you just constantly think of failure and never success. It's, exactly. I did not have somebody teach me a, a state of a mindset at a young age, you know, through sports, I kind of picked up on things here and there. However, nobody really told me the effect that our mind and what we think about has an, has an effect, the effect that it has on the external environment. Nobody so told me that our inner world directly affects our outer environment and outer world. So throughout this, where you're going to school and you have this severe anxiety, 
where was your parents in all this? Did they realize this? Did you hide it or were they just kind of not there for you in that sense? No, they did everything that they could, you know, to be there for me and support me. I think they kind of definitely knew that something was going on. However, I was in that like teenager type of mood, like 16, 17, my body was going through changes. I was very like rebellious. I was always that kid in class that kind of wanted to make everybody else laugh, right? Okay. Kind of rebellious. I was kind of making fun of the teacher, just doing a bunch of stupid stuff. And I would kind of distance myself from my parents a lot. Like I would come home and I would just go straight to my room. My parents would try to engage with me, ask me how my day was going, doing. And I just would distance myself, you know, it was like, I was just thought I knew everything type of teenager, you know, you know how kind of teenagers absolutely that, that stage can be. So, I mean, they did everything they could. They just didn't know the severity of it and kind of what was happening on a mental level that, I mean, I, I couldn't really explain it to anybody, you know, like, why are you nervous? I don't know. I just get nervous, you know? Right. You know, I didn't understand anxiety, which I think rehab helped me out a lot with because it taught me how to meditate. It taught me how to be calm. It taught me how to be present. It taught me a lot of spiritual practices that have stood the test of time throughout my studies that have that have positively impacted my life um, ever since the moment I learned them. So rehab both times were a tremendous blessing in my life. So you, you get out of rehab the first time. Right. You, you, you finally walk, you, you see all your high school friends and stuff like that. Now, describe to me, like, what takes you to the steps of, of, of taking pills? So let's see here. So my friends. So that summer, you know, all the grad parties were happening. We were kind of going from grad party to grad party. All my friends slowly started getting ready and they all started leaving the state, going to their college. A lot of my a lot of friends went to a house. Iowa State, which was down in Iowa, so a little bit south of where we lived. And so I found myself by myself and, you know, I needed to get some sort of money coming in or whatever. So I started to get a, I, I got a job at a local country club. Uh, I started out in the cabana by the pool and then I was a bus boy and I would valet. On top of that, I had a very bad gambling addiction. I would find myself going to the casino almost on a nightly basis, gambling hundreds and thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds and then thousands of dollars at the table on a nightly basis. And I found that um, as soon as I started to get into pills, not only were they super simple to use, like you just pop a pill in your mouth and immediately you feel instant relief, but they were sneaky and they were easy to take. And it's like very simple. So I, I found myself like taking these pills as I was gambling. And I noticed that it helped me gamble because it, it, I was taking these pills that were given to patients with bipolar disorder. So it would take away their emotional swing. So they wouldn't feel like super excited, super happy. At the same time, they wouldn't feel like bad or negative or all these negative emotions. So who, so did, who, who introduced you to the pills? Uh, these, these kids that I met the first time when I was in rehab, we weren't supposed to be talking about drugs, but you know, sometimes they would just mention like the, the stuff that they were taking and they would talk, they would talk about it in a positive light. And then I learned about it. And then I met some kids, um, from the town that I was at who sold pills and soon enough I was taking pills with them. And here's a crazy story too. You know, the second time I got out of rehab, I made a decision. I said, I need to, I need to get out and I need to make a change. Otherwise I'm just going to end up staying in my parents' basement for the rest of my life, or I'm going to end up from an overdose, dead from an overdose, or I'm going to end up in jail. Those were like the options I was looking at. So I decided to go to a Navy recruiter and a month later I was gone. I was in the Navy. And then a couple months after that, I get a phone call. I remember I was stationed down in San Diego. I was on the smoke deck. I got a phone call around 11 AM. And it was from my one of my closest friends, and he had told me that the guy who I was using pills with, Zach Zach Letourner, he had committed suicide, and he was hanging from a tree. And it's like that's the guy who I was with on a nightly basis. That's the guy who was selling me pills. That's the guy who I was taking pills with. I remember I had talked to him about suicide because it had been on my mind. And he told me not to do. He told me, you know, to think about my family, think about, you know, the future that we had in front of us. And he was always a kid that I looked up to. He was a year younger than me. And I just knew that he was ambitious. And he I knew that he was going to be something special. And for me to hear that news, 
it it rocked me to my core because that was the path that I was on. Like I could have easily, if I never joined the military, been in that tree with him, you know, with my life taken. And it's a very sad story, but you know, I credit him to a lot of the success that I've, you know, experienced in my life because he kept me alive. He's the reason. He's the reason why I'm still here, and I give you know a lot of thanks to him and to his family. Um, but I mean, it's a crazy addiction. Drugs are are a crazy addiction, and I think we'll get into this you know a little bit later on in the conversation. But addictions, they're not just with drugs and alcohol. Right. One thing that I've learned throughout my entire life, and the reason why I created a beautiful obsession, is because I think that we each suffer from our own addiction in our own way, in our own form or sense. And the addictions can range from drugs and alcohol to, you know, sex. I know you mentioned you just spoke with, to somebody about sex addiction, to cool. gambling addiction, to video games, to Netflix, to social media. Yeah, to, people who are workaholics. <laughs> yes, workaholics, sports, Which I am. Fitness. I'm, 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 a, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a workaholic. And like I tell you, today I've been up since 6 a.m. and doing all these things and – it is 10 p.m. now. I'm still going. I'm still wired, and I have to. I have to be pulled away. If not, I'll just keep on going. So yeah, well, absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that, Johnny, because there's. A, I think there's a difference between that and somebody you know who's been up since 6 a.m. drinking and feeling a negative sure. addiction. Absolutely. It's like yeah, I think absolutely. what what you have going on is something that I like to call a beautiful obsession because this is something that you're passionate about, right? You here you are on a, on a Sunday night. It's 10 p.m. your time over where you're at and you're, you're on this interview with me, you know, you're, you're extracting information from me that can not only possibly benefit yourself, but benefit the people that are going to be listening to this. Absolutely. So it's like, you're doing something for a greater cause for a better purpose. And I feel like, honestly, if you can name anybody on this entire planet, that's done something of importance with their life, you can look back and you can see that they were addicted to bringing their desires to manifestation, whether it's, Martin Luther King Jr., whether it's Abraham Lincoln, Benjamin Franklin, whether it's Grant Cardone or Tony Robbins or, you know, Ed Milet, Aubrey Marcus, uh, you know, I'm just I'm just going off the top of my head and just listing some people relevant and in the past or current current um, entrepreneurs and in the past entrepreneurs that have passed away that have done something incredible. Napoleon Hill, you know, Andrew yes. Carnegie, Earl Nightingale, all of these people became addicted they they had an addiction to bringing to life their desires and manifest they, and they 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 desired to manifest that into the physical reality and it's like that became their sole purpose it's what they thought about most of the time now back to earl nightingale back to the law of attraction what we think about most of the time is what we attract into our life when i was thinking about drugs and alcohol all the time that's what i was attracting to my life you know, I've had many addictions in my life, and it didn't just start with drugs and alcohol. I was addicted to sugar, and I think many of us, our first addictions are to sugar. If you think back to when you were a yeah. kid, your parents give you cookie or candy. It's like you go off the wall with sugar. That sugar rush feels good. It makes yeah, it you does. somebody you're not, <laughs> yeah. right? And then it was like I was addicted to video games. I would play video games nonstop to sports. I would be playing basketball nonstop. And then when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I got into masturbation. I got into pornography. I think those two right there and sex are huge topics that a lot of people are kind of iffy about talking about. But yet a lot of people, and you could be listening to this right now and you're suffering from this. And this is a big deal because this is, this is a very common addiction in men and in women as well. The addiction to pornography, the addiction to masturbation, to sex, all of those things are kind of channeling this gift. I call it a gift, gift of addiction in the wrong outlet. When we kind of put all of our attention and focus and addictive powers into the wrong outlet or wrong channel, such as social media or sex or video games, Netflix, et cetera, right? Sometimes work if it's bad, that kind of it kind of um, takes away from the power that we can be using to create a beautiful obsession. It's like what you're doing right now, Johnny. That That's transmuting the addiction, the negative connotation of addiction into something beautiful, right. which is what I call beautiful obsession because this is going to have a lasting impact on not only your life, but this is a recording that can be played, you know, for as long as this technology exists. This could Absolutely. be helping somebody for, you know, hundreds of years. This is generational. You know, so there's a difference, in my opinion, about um, addiction and obsession. 
Does that make sense? Did I explain no, that? No, it, 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 that makes total sense. So what made you come up with this beautiful obsession? So when I was in rehab, I was basically pointed a finger at, and I was told that I had a disease. I was told that I had something wrong with me. I was told that I was basically going to be handicapped for the rest of my life. There was nothing I could do about it. The best thing I should do with the rest of my life is just figure out ways how to not use drugs and alcohol. And that never sat well with me. That never sat well with me, the fact that I had a disease or that something was wrong with me. No, I just didn't like that at all, and I just didn't accept it. And I ran away from it for the longest time. I hit it when I went to the military. The recruiter basically told me not to say anything to anyone because otherwise I could be kicked out, you know, because I got in the military without them knowing that I had, you know, prior um, rehab visits, which wasn't, was, which was a no, no to get in the military. So I ran away from it for the longest time. And then I started to see that the same people that were pointing a finger at me were suffering from their own addictions. They just weren't labeled addictions. Mm. Right. I started to see that when I was in the military, people would be on their phones playing video games on their phones or on social media for eight to 10 hours out of the day. Yeah. And that's almost worse. It's, it's taking ourselves out of this beautiful life that we get to live and into, you know, um, the computer. It, ta- it takes us out of, you know, the present moment and puts us into technology and it takes us away from people and interactions into like false interactions with people online and you know the military i saw a lot of fitness people who are very you know were addicted to fitness which is you know something positive at least you know they're doing something great with their their bodies and their lives are living a healthy lifestyle but even then the addiction would sometimes get a little dark and i just saw many addictions you know a lot of people were drinking excessively doing drugs and a lot of people that were you know a lot there's a lot of stuff happening in the military And I kind of started to see that I wasn't the only one having this problem, but I was the only one that knew that it was an addiction and I knew the power that it had. And I kind of learned about addiction and the mental processes and the psychology, the psycho, the psychology behind addiction. When I was in rehab, I got, I I was basically instructed on it a lot, a lot of the time when I was in rehab. So when I got out of rehab and I kind of went on, I started on this entrepreneurial journey, I started to see that, you know, Everybody that I was reading about that had done something incredible, you know, biographies of Sam Walton or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or Steve Jobs or Tony Robbins, Grant Cardone, Ed Milet, all these people that I was reading about, they had all this common theme behind all of them, like this golden nugget or this golden string that kind of strung between all of their stories and messages. And it was like they had an obsession. They had... They had a dominating thought that consumed their life that they were just nonstop going after, whether it was business or, you know, feeding homeless people or, you know, creating a real estate portfolio and empire or writing a book, you know, everything that they would go after, they became obsessed with. And Ed Milet has a great quote. He said, you know, our obsessions become our possessions. I I love that quote because like what you obsessed about and what you're thinking about on a constant basis is one day you're going to hold it in your hand and one day it's going to come forth into the physical reality because your thinking makes it so and so like i started to see that like the people that were becoming addicted with business and and building huge business empires and entrepreneurial startups that were changing the face of the earth like jeff bezos and amazon right yeah. nobody called n- nobody called amazon and like Jeff Bezos with Amazon and addiction, nobody would ever, ever think about calling that, calling it that. But I see it as that. I see it as he became addicted with, you know, creating a store that was going to encompass the entire world that was just going to change the way things were sold online. And he did that. He did that. You know, Elon Musk is obsessed with getting to Mars. Nobody calls that an addiction, but it's an obsession that he has. And it's beautiful because it's going to impact humanity, in my opinion, for the better. So it's like, Nobody talks about these things as addiction, but a lot of people do put the label of obsession on them. And I think that they're beautiful obsessions because, you know, they're they're positive in their own individual's life, but also in the grand scheme of things as bettering and improving humanity as a whole. No, absolutely. And you know, you spoke about your, your, your friend that passed away that hung himself and you were on 
that on that uh, ship. What happened then at that moment when you got that news? I just realized the the effect that our decision has, that our decisions have on our lives. It's like I was at a crossroad, you know. I the second time I went to rehab, I actually approached my parents. And I said, I need to go to rehab. This time it's worse. And it's like, if I didn't make that decision to like, like put my pride aside and say, you know, I need to go back to rehab, I would probably be dead right now. And it's like, I understand that he made his decision and I made my decision and we, we went on two separate paths. And it was extremely devastating for me to hear that news. And I'm very you know, thankful for the time that I had spent with Zach while he was here. However, I understand that like, no matter what you and I do today, Johnny, the time still moves forward. And a year from now, like even if we are lazy for the rest of the entire year, whether we sit on the couch or whether we go out there and publish six books and record, you know, 400 episodes on a podcast, whatever it is that we do, time still passes. Absolutely. And it's like the decisions that we have are truly like they, they are the stepping stones to ultimately our destiny. So it's like every decision that you make, that we make is, is crucial, you know, to the grand scheme of how our lives are going to end. Or, I mean, like in the big picture of things, does that make sense? I feel like, no, I no, it that already does. So after you come out rehab the second time, what happens then? Well, I got out of rehab. I moved up north to go to a sober house I was living out of, I think, in St. Paul. And after my time was up there, I came back home. I was on the couch, and I saw a commercial for the Navy. And I was like, man, how cool would it be to be a United States Navy SEAL? And I talked to my dad about it. He took me over to a recruiter. I didn't even really talk to my mom about it. Next thing you know, I signed up for the military, and I was shipped out a month later to Great Lakes, Illinois. And with that experience going there, how long were you in the military for? I served four years, four years in the, in the United States Navy, and one tour. Throughout that time, did you dance with thinking about using again? Oh, absolutely. So my addictions actually worsened in the military. So when I first joined the military, I ran away from that addiction. I didn't even think about drinking for the longest time because I knew that I, ha I was an addict, basically, because I told, you know, I was told in rehab over and over that I was an addict and I had, you know, this problem. And so I didn't even think about using. I didn't think about drinking or none of that. And then a couple of years after it goes by and I started, I was drinking occasionally here and there. And then... Um, are you familiar with like vaping? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Vaping was very big in the military. And one of the things that you could put in vape and this in like the vape in like your coils and cotton balls and, and whatnot was this stuff called it was synthetic marijuana, basically. And it was called, uh, I think, uh, Armageddon. And this stuff, this stuff, man, it effed me up bad. I would smoke this every single day. And it's, it's not something that could show up on a, on a urine test. So I couldn't get kicked out of the military for it. But it was so bad. It was like 10 times worse than any, you know, drug that you can find on this planet. But it was synthetic. It was man-made. And it was like, it was just crazy. I remember I was smoking that while we were out to sea, while we were doing night ops. I had night vision goggles. I probably should not be talking about this, but at the same time, like this is a real problem that we face not only like in the military, but with synthetic drugs. If anybody's listening to this right now and they're messing with synthetic drugs, just stop. Just stop because that stuff is is no joke. It is messed up. And uh, yeah, so my, my uh, addictions just transmuted into different outlets while I was in the military. I was also... I kept my gambling addiction going for a little bit while I was in the military. I'd go to the casino quite a bit. I also picked up fitness, so I started getting big into fitness. But that the, that smoking, that synthetic stuff was a big one. And, you know, I had a couple girlfriends in the military, and, you know, the, the sex addiction definitely kicked on. That's all I was thinking about for the longest time. It's like my addiction just went from one to, the, to another to another to another to another. It just bounced back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And now I kind of find myself in the entrepreneurial space, 
And it's like, I understand addiction is a gift and I understand that we can transmute addiction and do a beautiful obsession and really use it to change our lives. And it's like, now I ask myself, like, what do I want to become addicted to? Like, what do I want to become obsessed with? Right. Because so what, that's, yeah, that's, that's where the power lies. It's like, when you ask yourself that question, like, what do I want to do for the next five to 10 years? What do I want to become obsessed with and just dominate for the next five to 10 years and then just get into it? So after the military, obviously you're using during the military, after you, you serve your four years, thank you for serving. Definitely. Um, what happens then? Are you continuing to use? What made you snap and realize you need to re refocus yourself? So great question. So when I was in the military, while I was on tour, <clears throat> while I was deployed, my little girl was born. I have a daughter. She's four years old. And she was born and I wasn't able to make their, make it there for the birth. But I remember specifically one night I was just on the flight deck and my daughter had been born a couple of days prior. We had had a scary situation happen earlier that month where we actually lost a Marine. And I was just on the flight deck and I just remember asking myself, like, what am I doing? You know, like, do I want to continue to make these sacrifices that I'm making in the military? Like I, I was basically, I kind of started to find my groove in the military. I was very successful, but also I would walk into rooms and I would just try to beam positive positivity everywhere. I would go up to everybody. I would talk to them. I would engage. I would remain positive, had a positive outlook on everything. And everybody would tell me that, you know, you should be a motivational speaker. You know, I could see you on stage one day doing this. And the more people would tell me that, the more it, it seeped into my mind. And then the decision came where I was asked, you know, do you want to stay in or do you want to get out? And they, the, my superiors at the time, the chiefs and senior chiefs and master chiefs, they all asked me to stay in. They, they said I was an asset, you know, and I, I agreed. I was very good at my job in the military. But at the same time, I had this like gut calling. I had this intuition that I needed to chase, you know, a higher purpose, a greater calling in life. I think that I was, it was time for me to pass on the torch. You know, the military is, I'm very proud of my military service, but at the same time, I understand and I respect those who are currently serving and have served in the past because I understand the sacrifices that must be made to do that. And I realized that I just was not willing to make that sacrifice anymore. I had missed my daughter's birth. You know, there, there was, there was plenty of chances where I could have died when I was in the military. And it's like, do I want to continue to live this way only for a mediocre retirement after serving 20 years? You know, right. I'd get health, I'd get health benefits, dental benefits, but then a mediocre retirement, a mediocre after, you know, sacrificing 20 years of your life. It just didn't make sense to me. I wanted to be, you know, very financially well off, financially abundant. Um, and the military was not the way to do that. So I just decided that it was my time to get out. And I kind of got out on a whim. And ever since then, it's just been a whirlwind. Good. This is great. So you, you get out. Are you using at this point? So I wasn't using. I got out and I was staying with my buddy for a while while I was trying to get on my feet. And, you know, marijuana had just gotten legalized back in 2016 when I had just gotten out. So I was smoking <coughs> here and there. But nothing, uh, nothing serious, no. And that didn't lead to anything else. I'm sorry. That didn't lead to anything else. I mean, I would drink occasionally, but for the most part, um, I was kind of just more focused on, you know, becoming better and like, what can I do to, you know, get closer to my goals. So I kind of wasn't too wrapped up in it. Um, but yeah. So, so what goals did you wind up setting for yourself? When I first got out? Yeah. <clears throat> so when I first got out of the military, I moved up north in California, and I was introduced into a company, uh, an insurance agency, where I, was selling, I would be selling life insurance. And I was around a very um, big group of ambitious entrepreneurs, and they pushed me and challenged me, and they you know, they definitely instill the mindset into me of, you know, win. And I, that's where I, that's where I learned a lot of uh, the law of attraction mindset is the people that I met at this insurance agency. And a lot of the goals that I had set 
were very, uh, you know, relative to the business, which I, I, I did achieve for the most part. However, one thing happened when I, when I got out of the military is I got into an unexpected relationship where I just fell head over heels in love with this woman that I had met in this business and she alone changed my entire life on how I view love, on how I view relationships, on how I view a lot of things. And she kind of derailed my entrepreneurial ventures at the time because again, the power of addiction, it's like when I was in a relationship, I when I fell in love with this girl, she became my addiction. Like she was all I would think about. I would be driving in my car and I, I wouldn't be thinking about business or making a sale with insurance or anything like that. I was thinking about her. And, uh, you know, that was a very powerful moment because I understood at that time, like the power of my, of my thoughts, of my addiction. It was like, I, I completely dropped out of business and I was just focused on her. And, you know, one thing led to another and that didn't work out. Um, ended up heartbroken. And that was a, one of the best lessons I've ever learned in my life. But that, that kind of derailed me for business for, for a while. Um, but again, it all happened for me, not to me. It happened, you know, for a, a greater reason. There was a lesson that I needed to learn from that experience, but yeah. So, so you were definitely super aware of your addictions that, that would come up or resurface or one would take over for another. At this time, you, 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 since you were so aware, did you not sort out any type of therapy? So I, that's a great question. So I was in therapy toward the end of my military career. <clears throat> I was seeking, I was speaking with a therapist on a weekly basis. However, when I got out, I didn't, didn't seek therapy after that. And as far as the awareness, awareness of the addictions go, the thing with, the thing with it is, is that when we look back in hindsight, we're always, our vision is always 2020. We can go ahead and we can connect the dots. We can see that, okay, like this addiction really took over right here. And it really kind of led me down this path, but it happened ultimately for my better good. It's like, we can connect the dots very easily looking back. However, in the moment when I was in the relationship, man, I was doing everything to rationalize my behavior and my decisions, right? I'd be like, you know, should I go to this meeting? <clears throat> should I go to this appointment? to try to close this client or should I go on a lunch date with the girl who I was in love with? Right. And I would be like, yeah, lunch date is no problem. And I would rationalize everything in my mind to make sense of it. So at the time I didn't see it as an addiction at the time, you know, we, I was kind of blind, you know, love kind of makes us blind and arrogant to what's really happening in our, in our world. But it was like, yeah, I was just totally focused on, on her at the time, but I didn't really seek therapy. I didn't really seek, um, outside help. I just kind of tried to deal with it on my own, which again, looking back on was not, pro was not, was probably not the best decision. I definitely think outside help and, uh, so another person's opinion, especially unbiased opinion would have definitely benefited me in that situation. So at this time, how were you still insecure about yourself? How, like how you was in high school, how were you dealing with that and your anxiety? So Another, that's a fantastic question. So when I was in high school, it was basically a lot of, a lot of images, a lot of, uh, problems with my self image, specifically my fitness and things like that. When I was in the military, I got big into fitness. You know, I, I basically worked out, you know, consistently for four or five years. So when I got out of the military, I was still working out constantly. So that, in, that in, obviously it increased my self image, my self confidence, so I wasn't having those insecure thoughts like I was in high school. However, that insecure kid from high school still exists somewhere inside of me. I am still, you know, very shy. I'm, I'm naturally very introverted. Like when we're having conversations like this, when I'm getting to know somebody, when I'm talking about something that I'm passionate about, obviously I'm not introverted. I'm very extroverted. However, for the most part, I do like to be by myself a lot. I like to be by myself outside in nature when I'm at the gym. You know, I like my alone time. That could be, you know, my my astrology sign, Sagittarius. I don't know. I, I really don't know why I like to be alone so much. But for the most part, my self-confidence and my self-image increased with the amount of work that I put into my body. 
and the hours that I spent kind of sculpting and molding my body in, uh, into like the physical, physical aspect of it. And what about suicidal thoughts? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? What about suicidal thoughts? Never, never again. Once I, uh, once I got help the second time in rehab and I, I joined the military, very, that, that, that ceased to stop, that stopped. So as you continue to, to grow and, you know, you kept on moving on, what made you realize, what was the, the, the shift, that paradigm that really made you say, hey, I'm going to go this direction? Well, I think I have a natural gift. So I kind of started to look at what are my, what are my strengths? I, ha I think like one of the gifts that <clears throat> a lot of people have told me, a lot of friends and relatives have told me is one of my strong suits is, you know, my ability to communicate and convey a message to kind of relate to the audience or whoever it is that's listening and kind of convey a message in a, in a simple way that's easy to understand, as well as I'm, I'm very kind of motivational in the sense of I speak a lot of powerful things, powerful phrases, powerful stories, powerful words. And so I think like one of my strengths would be to help people or help others, help serve others in the form of, you know, communication in a sense. So I kind of started to see like, what are my strengths? What am I passionate about? What kind of gets me going on a daily basis? And then kind of just follow that route and just see where it takes me. So like right now in my entrepreneurial ventures, I'm working on getting on stage. I want to start speaking on stage and just because uh, for the audience that's listening right now, it's like you, you, you may hear me as composed, even though I feel like I'm stuttering quite a bit. Um, however, I still I'm very fearful. I'm scared to get on stage. I'm scared to get on, on you know, on stage in front of, you know, even just uh, a couple people in front of like 10 people. I still get anxiety. I still get nervous. And it's like I want to overcome that because where the fear is, is ultimately, I think, kind of points in our mind where we need to focus on that's that's the part of us that needs the most love and we need to kind of dive into that fear in order to grow that's where the growth is ultimately going to happen so as far as like the direction that i'm choosing to go moving forward it's kind of just based on what i feel like my strengths are and kind of where i feel is like what i'm passionate about and kind of what i feel like my life's purpose is However, I was just reading a book called Higher Status by Jason Capital, who's a fantastic entrepreneur out here in Newport Beach, California. And he was talking about how kind of finding your life's purpose, your life's mission, uh, your one true passion is kind of like peeling the layers off of an onion. So like at the beginning, you have like low hanging fruit. You have the outside layers of the onion. It's like right now I have opportunities in front of me that may not be my life's purpose, but once I tackle it and give that 100%, whether it's for a few weeks, a few months, even a couple of years, I'll eventually be able to peel back that layer and say like, oh, this was it, or maybe it wasn't it. All right, now I'm getting closer to my life's purpose. I think what's cost me a lot of time is kind of waiting for like one thing or one event to kind of jump into my life where it says like, hey, Clint, this is the direction that you need to go, like clear signs you know, alarms going off in my head, like this is the route, this is the way to go. And when in reality, that, that doesn't happen, we just kind of have to take and seize the opportunities that life gives us. And then, you know, one door will lead to the next one opportunity will lead to the next. It's an, Absolutely. It reminds, yeah, it reminds Absolutely. me of that quote before before you take over uh, no, 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 no. Quote by Martin Luther King Jr. So he says, faith is taking the taking the first step, even when you can't see the entire staircase. No, you're absolutely right. It's, it's like uh, having, it's like being in a filter. It's like being a filter. You know, you know that everything flows through the filter, and whatever gets caught up in the filter is the trash that you don't need. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that's how it is. If, if and when you spoke about fear, you know, fear can usually do, go two different directions, and one definitely it can just put you at a at a screeching halt and make you stop. And then some people take that and they run with it and say, "Fuck it." I'm going to, I'm going to get there anyway. I want to go on stage regardless and, and screw it and make something happen. And that's where I think a lot of people tend to not go after what they want to go after the insecurity part. Um, listening to other people, you know, you're lucky enough that people saw 
so um that thing about you they, about, about you being able to communicate and and really give service to a message that people can understand and when you don't have folks like that around you it, it is tough to to try to come around and find yourself and and i wrote a book about purpose last year and it was actually based off my ig page and pretty much it was just saying like you know you motivation is is fickle motivation is like a shot of adrenaline right because people get motivated every every new year's and they go to the gym for about two months and they stop you got to have that drive you got to have that x factor to continue going on even when you plateau it may not see no results right away so by saying that have you plateaued at any time that made you think about going back to using because you didn't see the results you were getting Many times, <clears throat> many times, and I think uh, <clears throat> you you illustrated that very well. One of the one of my mentors, he illustrates life as kind of waves, right? We kind of have waves in our life where we'll hit highs, where we start to make a little bit more money than we're used to, or we have lows where our bank account, you know, drops below a certain point where it it kicks on the panic monster. I don't know if you've seen that famous TED talk. I think I forgot. I forgot what it's called exactly, but I'll have to send you the link here when I okay. find it. Definitely. But he talks about how you know he he talks about it with procrastination. It's on procrast. The video is on procrastination, but this kind of applies with anything in life. It's like we kind of have this internal thermometer, right? And it's like I'll just use this with finances, and then we'll trickle it down into other areas of life. It's like let's say your goal is, you know. All of us have an identity. Oh man, this could, this could go really deep. All right, so let's do it. <laughs> the thing the thing about the ego, right? So the ego, it's like when I say when you ask me, you know, give give a little background of who Clint Berry is. Like who who is Clint Berry? Clint Berry is is a fictitious character that my ego kind of identifies itself as that separates me from everything else. It's like Clint is different from Johnny because this this this. Like Clint is you know, a 6'3 white guy from Plymouth, Minnesota with blue eyes and this and this and this, right? Characteristic traits. But honestly, this character that Clint Berry is, is a fictitious character that I assume the identity of on a daily basis. And I play and I act accordingly to my beliefs on who I am as an individual in this world. But in reality, it's like our ego is, is false, you know, in, 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 I don't want to get like too, too deep, but the ego, it's, it's something that I would definitely encourage um, anybody who's listening to this to look into on a, on a, you know, kind of go down that rabbit hole and, and truly try to understand what the ego is. Because when I say I, when I say me, when I say all of these, you know, phrases, I'm, I'm referring to my ego and it's, it's very interesting. It trips me out. But anyways, what I was trying to say is that? Can you repeat the original question? Because I try to go back. I think a little bit too far. No, you're fine. You're actually on track. Um, I'm loving the way you're breaking everything down. It pretty much is. It was about how how far you um, if and when the transition of you trying to go after something and plateauing, did yes. you go back trying to use? There you go. Perfect. All right. So the identity that the ego creates, right? Let's say that my identity is. Let's just say $10,000 a month, okay? $10,000 a month, that's what I'm comfortable making. That's kind of right in the middle of everything, right? And let's say I, I have a good month and let's say I make $15,000 a month. But my identity is $10,000. I'm gonna, na like subconsciously, on a subconscious and unconscious level, my, in my internal thermometer is gonna kick on. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm gonna start spending that money or sabotaging my success till I get back to the level that I'm comfortable with, with my identity, which at the moment right now, let's say fictitiously is $10,000 a month and vice versa. Let's say I get below a certain point financially. Let's say that like, let's say that I'm comfortable with $10,000 in my bank account, right? And let's say I get below $5,000 in my bank account. All of a sudden the panic monster turns on, the heat kicks on. My internal thermometer is like going crazy. It's like, oh my gosh, you got to do everything possible. And then you just like snap into it and you do everything you can to get back to that comfort zone, back to where your identity is established. 
And it's like, I think that's what ultimately what prevents a lot of people from moving forward, especially people that have that suffer from, you know, New Year's itis, where they create all these New Year's goals and they expect their identity to change overnight. When in reality, they wake up, they may go to the gym a couple of days in a row, they may start to eat healthier a couple of days in a row, but they haven't changed the underlying issues of their identity issue, which is, you know, who they see themselves as, right? So yes, I've seen a lot of plateaus in my life. I've seen a lot of ups and a lot of downs. And it's like, this is something that I struggle with on a daily basis is raising my identity, which I think this book that I'm reading right now by Jason Capital, Higher Status, I think this is so fascinating because he talks about all these people, specifically like Robert Downey Jr., how they view themselves and kind of a higher status is, status is ultimately how they raise their identity to attract what it is that they want into their lives. Because as you raise your identity, you know, you cannot make a million dollars in a year if you have a $10,000 identity. You can't make a million dollars if you have a $100,000 identity, right? You need to have a million dollar identity before you make a million dollars. It's like, why do we want all of these things, especially the ego with materialistic needs and desires? It's like, why does the ego want a new car? Why? Because not because it's going to like do anything for us on a spiritual level, but because possibly we might receive external validation from people who don't really care. They just are going to see that, oh, this guy's got a nice car. And it's like a lot of the time I, I hear this from entrepreneurs all the time. It's like once they fulfill that materialistic desire and they get these nice cars or the nice house or the nice watch or whatever, it's like, it goes away. That fulfillment goes away. That doesn't Absolutely. bring us, that doesn't bring us true fulfillment. I can attest to that myself. I, years ago I had a BMW. My goal was to get a BMW. I had it. Uh, and I had it for a year and I got, I got tired of it. Yeah. Cause after I had it, I drove it. And don't get me wrong. It's a beautiful machine. Yeah. It drove fantastic. Yeah. But, but, I think it was more of the process, the journey that I enjoyed more uh -huh. than the actual summit. You know what well, I'm saying? Of, I want to get into it. this. This is a fantastic point. I want to get into that. Just do it. That, I think what you said, perfect. You said that the journey was more rewarding than the end result, right? Yes. Earl Nightingale in that, in that famous uh, speech that he gave, The Strangest Secret, he talks about the definition of success. He states that the definition of success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. So ultimately, where you've probably found the most success was in the progressive realization, in the progressive getting closer on a daily basis towards that end goal of getting the BMW, right? You probably found that more rewarding, like the moments leading up to you actually fulfilling your goal was was I'm assuming more rewarding than actually getting the car. Absolutely. One, I, as soon as I was able to sign for it and all the drama it took for me to get there to sign for that car. Yeah. I, oh, I was ecstatic. I was more happier in the chair to sign the paperwork. Yeah. Then don't get me wrong, I was happy when I drove the lot too. Uh huh. But it wasn't the same feeling. Exactly. Cause now I had it. I was like, oh shit, what next? Me, the, the next question me, is what's next? Yes. It's always what's next. And that's the ego. That's the ego tricking us right there. It's like the ego always puts, you know, importance on external um, materialistic things. It's like, oh, if I have this car, I'll be happy. Oh, if I have this dream home or this dream job or this dream relationship, I'll be I'll finally be happy. I'll finally become the person that I see myself as if I have this. It's like, no, 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 no. First, you become the person that you want to become, and then the things get attracted in your life. First, you become happy with where you're at, and then everything else just kind of trickles down. But I wanted to ask you, Johnny, how, would, how do you think you would have felt if you would have bought that BMW for somebody else? Um, I would have felt I guess, more, more, I would have, been, I would have had more, more gratification. Definitely. Yeah. I think I would have, I would have felt cause I'm giving it away. Yes. Um, and that's the thing about gifting. When you give something away like that or anything for a matter, it could be whatever it is. It could be something very really small. But when you, when you do something for someone else, it does something to you. It's a hard feeling to describe. It's a great feeling, but it does, does something to you. And you want to continue to repeat that again. You know what I call that, Johnny? I call that the soul's fulfillment. So okay. we have we have a different a difference between the ego and the soul, right? 
the ego is kind of like this illusion that separates all of us, but it's like the soul also calls out for fulfillment. And it's like when you are giving to somebody, when you are in service to others, that brings about a type of fulfillment that's that's not recognized by the ego, but is picked up by the soul as you're on the right path. You're doing something that's that's bettering, you know, the world, the universe. That's funny you say that because I this is what the podcast is for me. And I, I, my IG, the, the, it states this is this podcast is for the people. It's not even for me. Uh huh. This is for for people to get their stories out. You know, even though I I I get from it as far as learning, getting to know new people, having great conversations with folks, but my platform is really not my platform. It's actually the people's platform. And to have it's for me to be able to to develop something like that, folks. It's really you're right. It is filling my soul up. It is. It's a. It's another level of fulfillment, and it's so much more beautiful than anything a materialistic item could give us. It's like I think I heard you know somebody say this, and I'm just gonna pass this along to the audience. Anybody who's listening to this, I encourage you to go out there and get anything that you possibly can think of that you think will will make you happier. Anything that's materialistic. If you think uh, uh, of driving a Ferrari every single day is going to make you happier, go out and do it. Like make enough money and, and buy a Ferrari and go drive it every single day. You'll see what we're, what we're talking about right now, that that fulfillment, you might, it may last for, you know, a couple months. You might get high off, you know, um, the purchase and the realization of owning a Ferrari. But after a while, you're going to realize that it's just another car that gets you from point A to point B. Whether it's it a, a $1,000 watch or a $300,000 watch, you're going to realize that they both tell the same time. Absolutely. Whether it's you know a mansion or a two-bedroom condo, they're both places to rest your head at night. Exactly. Exactly. No, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, um, you, you see folks driving around with nice things and, and people who don't have similar items, you know, they tend to envy those folks. And they don't understand, one, how hard they may have worked for that. You know, and and two, you know, are they really happy with that item? And they could just be fucking stuck with it because you know that they, they spent two hundred grand on it, <laughs> right? So, I think a lot of folks have to understand, especially when they're not in position to win, is because they're not putting themselves in position to win, mm -hmm. and, and it's all about mindset, right? Absolutely, it's all about you creating that mindset for yourself, knowing that you are winning as of right now. And I think people have to take the monetary things out of it. Like, you know, it's, it's money is there, no doubt. We all need it. We all have to pay a bill or whatever. We have to live off of it. But you, everything doesn't need to be monetized. You know, if, if you love to do artwork and you still have to keep your day job and your career, then go ahead and do that. You know, make it more than just a hobby. But just go ahead and do it. Now, if it turns in, winds up turning into a business, then great for you. If you're if you're good enough to be an entrepreneur, which everyone is not there to be an entrepreneur, it's just okay to have a career, right? Just be the best at it. You know, be the subject matter expert, know who your stakeholders are, and just make it happen for yourself, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think that's a, a very wonderful point you touched on. If there's something that just brings you fulfillment and something that you're passionate about, just do it. And th there will be there will be a, some way, somehow in the future, where you'll be able to monetize that and it, and it will pay off. Absolutely. But it's like... This life is too short to slave away at a job you don't like for 40 years out of your life only to just have a measly retirement and have to stay at a retirement home till you die. Yes. It's like, you know, I just, I cannot stress enough the importance of just being happy, finding things that, that bring you happiness and then just pursuing them. Can, can you also talk about as far as networking, like how important it is to network? I think networking is crucial to success. I think a very common quote, a couple common quotes is a bir birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you show me your five closest friends and I'll show you the person you're going to be in five years. Um, your network, your net worth, your net, your network is your net worth. Right. Right. There's a, there's a lot of quotes that touch on this, the power of networking. Yeah. But it's like for anybody that's that's watching, that's listening to this right now, it's like whatever it is that you want to do in life, any industry that you want to be in, fitness, you know, financial, um, podcast, anything, 
find somebody who's done what you want to do and that's years ahead of you and then just and and put yourself out there and meet them and ask them to help you help cut your learning curve to save you time because that's so important it's like if if you take somebody who's totally okay with making minimum wage they go to McDonald's and they're making $10 and 50 cents an hour and every single week they're getting a paycheck for like 300 bucks right you take that person who's totally fine with that and you put them in a room with entrepreneurs that are making $100,000 a day, a day off their phones, right? Do you think that that's going to change that person's paradigm and worldview? Yeah. I guarantee you they'll, they'll go back to McDonald's and they'll, they'll think to themselves, how, why am I settling for this right now? I was just in a room full of people that are making $100,000 a day, a day. Wow. You know what I mean? That's going to totally change your mind and it, your your level your level of thinking. It's going to change the the possibilities that you think are out there for yourself. And that's and and like if if you if you are comfortable right now, chances are it's because you're surrounding yourself with people who aren't pushing you or aren't you know invested in your success. And it's like sometimes you'll meet somebody at an event or you know even at a Starbucks or you know wherever. And they could have, you know, better intentions for you than somebody you've known your entire life. A lot of the times, the friends that we grew up with are kind of anchors and they hold us back in the sense of when you start to like, when you start to grow and you start to think like bigger things are possible for you and you start to see success, but the other people that you grew up with or that you're really close with aren't like aren't pushing themselves. They're still lazy. They go to the bar and drink. It's like they're going to start to send hate your way because it's like if you make it, what's their excuse? They're just Correct. lazy at that right. point. And it's like that's threatening to them. That's very threatening. And it's like they'll do things either subconsciously, unconsciously, unknowingly that are going to try to sabotage you from your success. Absolutely. So it's very important who you network with, who you so kind of – who you bump heads with, rub shoulders with. You know, it's like, yeah, it's very powerful on how to change your identity quickly. Surround yourself with people that, first of all, of, are where you want to be. And second, you know, are, are just killing it and watch what it does to your identity. So you being an introvert and for people out there who are introverts, how do you how do you manipulate your networking? How do you how do you network since you have that tendency? So I try to go to events as many times as I possibly can. And when I'm at events, I notice that it's a very short term thing. Like an event's either going to be a day, two days, three days. And I understand that like, I'm only here for a, a little bit. So like, I'm, I'm naturally introverted. But again, when I've had a lot of solitude, when I've had a lot of me time, when I, you know, find myself meditating by myself a lot, it's like that kind of recharges me and allows me to go into a networking event with like specific intentions. It's like, okay, who who in here is in my industry? Okay, that narrows it down. All right. Who in here has done what I want to do? Okay, that narrows it down even farther. Right. And then it's like, all right, now let me just go talk to those specific people. Let me just go change numbers. Let me just go put myself in an opportunity where I could get lucky. Right. Maybe I just run into somebody and he just wants to be my mentor and he helps me cut the learning curve that it was going to take me for the next 10 years you know, to do what this guy's done and I can do it in a year now because he's kind of pouring himself into me. I don't know if you realize this, but people who are successful are way more supportive of up and coming entrepreneurs or people that are ambitious because they understand the struggle and the sacrifice that it takes to make it the hard work. And it's like a lot of these people, you know, we kind of talk about, we touched on this just moments ago, the difference between the ego and the soul, the ego kind of puts its fulfillment in materialistic things. But it's like the people that are successful have already gone through that process where they've bought the nice cars, the nice watches, the nice houses, and they see they've felt it on a real time basis that it doesn't provide the fulfillment that it does as the same way as maybe helping a young entrepreneur and watching him become a success. That to, that to a mentor is probably the most rewarding thing that you can do for somebody. I think people have to understand too, like when you chase after material items, it's different from when, it's different from when you have enough money where you can live a certain lifestyle, right? So it's either you chase after material things and be broke, or you have amassed wealth 
to afford you to live a certain lifestyle that if you wanted to, you can buy certain things. That makes sense? Yes. And people tend to confuse the two. Oh, well, that person has this 6,000 square foot home. They have this, this Rolls Royce. Well, yeah, they their, their net worth is like $50 million. So that makes sense. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> right? Um, your net worth is about 500 grand and you're trying to buy this Ferrari right now. <laughs> right. You know, it, it's different. Now yeah. you're just trying to show out. And that person, and a lot of times, if, if you look at Warren Buffett, he, lives in, he has lived in the same house for the past 40, 50 freaking years. Exactly. You know, um, he drives a Cadillac. You know, his wife gives him a budget for breakfast. Or so he, loves, he loves McDonald's. He goes to McDonald's every morning. You know, so his wife gives him a budget, just enough money to buy his breakfast in the morning. Mm-hmm. And he works in the same office with the same people for the past 30 years, which is an amazing thing. You, you, said, you said you're a fan of the hip-hop community, correct? Yes, I am. So another example that we can use, I think the hip hop community is is in a very interesting time right now because you have like the young SoundCloud rappers that are just making money and just spending it all on bling and on the rappers' know, kids. I call it. Yeah. But then you have you have kind of this these OGs like uh, Jay Z and now Meek Mill, Nipsey Hussle. All of these guys are starting to preach about the business side of everything. Correct. Right. Where, you know, you own your own rights or, you know, instead of investing in a jewelry, you start investing in a property, yep. real estate, land, assets, exactly. assets that, you know, are going to pay you for the rest of your life, create generational wealth. And it's very interesting right now because I'm so glad that people like Jay-Z and Nipsey Hussle, all these, these kind of artists are coming out and like trying to tell these younger rappers like, hey, man, like save your bag. Like, don't just get a bag from doing a show and go blow it all on jewelry. Don't spend like 85K on jewelry. Like, for what? Yeah, right? absolutely. Because you can't sell it and get the same amount of back because it's custom. Exactly. <laughs> you know, since, you know, and that's what people have to understand. Yeah, it's gold, there's diamonds in it, but you're, you're only going to get the weight off of it. You know what I'm saying? And that's it. And then, knowing that, sometimes it's going to be less than that because how am I going to sell this piece that you have here of, of whatever you, you decide to? make of uh, uh uh i don't know it could be the the, the face of uh the sore face right of that of that horror movie if you put that in a, in a gold piece who the hell is really gonna buy that shit next so people have to look at that the, the to your point with the generational wealth this is something where the culture never had never 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 knew about now, i'm bringing you from brooklyn new york from bed and grew up in a, grew up in the projects there is no communication, no studying, no no information passed down about how to live. It's always about how to survive. So my parents did very well how to survive. So I can survive. Put me in a, in a, in a bad neighborhood. I can survive. I know how to talk to talk, walk to walk. But to to know how to live, I had to teach myself. I had to read constantly. I had to surround myself with other mentors. And um, you know, I had never seen a white person until I I went into Manhattan, and I started working. And then, believe it or not, they became my mentors. They 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 started fucking with me. They like, oh, I like the way you think. And one of my mentors had me watching the news because he felt my English was horrible. And he was like, I need you to start watching the the, the late night news. <laughs> he was like, because I need you to understand how that reporter would say the same thing six times but in a different way. And I had to do that and uh, to keep my job. He said, I will fire you. And I'm like 15 at the time. Oh. He's like, I I will fire you if you don't do this. And I started doing it. You know, I was a knucklehead. I didn't do it the first month. And he, he put me in his office and he was about to fire me. And then one night I was watching the Honeymooners back then at like midnight. They do Honeymooners and they have a rerun of the actual news from the 6, 6 p.m. Uh, slot. And um, I was just smoking some trees and I said, fuck it. Let me just watch this shit. And I kept on watching and watching and watching. And I actually understood what they were talking about. And I was always an avid reader. So that was to help as well. I always had interest into things. But mm-hmm. to your point, like, you know, with these young cats trying to just buy the rapper's kit and and show out, you know, um, they, they have to learn about money. And and you said this earlier about education. Education doesn't set us up for anything. It really doesn't touch us anything that's valuable as of today or, or for tomorrow. It, it's, just, it's just basically t- teaching you to fucking take a test to get a piece of paper. Um, that really doesn't get you far at all, right? So if if we had curriculum that would show people how to 
really work. I, I think economics should really be taught like throughout your elementary to middle to high school. Like, so you can really have a true breakdown of economics and really have people understanding that. Like, not too many people understand that at all. And hence, that's why you have people who don't have savings accounts, right? And mm-hmm. I, I don't want to go preaching here, but that's to, but to your point, you bring up so many points about this. And but it comes down to the mindset. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so like, what do you feel, and can make that that change? And it, sometimes it could be a very cultural thing as well, right? So, what do you feel as, as like you said, Nipsey Hussle and Jay Z's? They are talking, but I these younger kids feel like they know everything. This this millennial group feel like they know everything. What what was your question specifically? Like, what's as far my as, advice to them? Yeah, for like for millennials and because like I said, the millennials feel like they know everything. Yeah, no, I found myself in that situation countless times where I thought, you know, I knew what was best or that I knew everything. And it's like, you know, we're all kind of on different levels of this game of life. And it's like, I've really started to see it recently that it's like, we're not physical beings, you know, living in a physical world. I think that we're all spiritual beings living in physical vessels, having, you know, a physical experience. And it's like, I think on a spiritual sense, as we evolve spiritually and as we kind of grow to new levels in our faith and our understanding of, you know, truth and oneness and things like that, it kind of allows us to see the bigger picture. And it's like, you can only bring a horse to the water. You can't make the horse drink. And it's, I think like a lot of the times millennials, I've tried to talk to people for hours on end and try to give them advice only for not any, not like one of my words to get through their heads. It's like people have to understand a, the first thing that they made me do when I was in rehab, right, was to understand the definition of insanity. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and getting the same and expecting a different result. So one thing that I would do with my drug and alcohol use is that I would continue to smoke or drink or take pills and I would expect it to make me happy. It's like when you, when, when I chase cars or I chase women or I chase house or money or all these things, I chase it and I expect it to bring me happiness when in reality it doesn't. And it's like, until you understand that, until you understand if we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always got. It's like you really have to be receptive to new information and kind of humble yourself. I read this funny quote. It was like, there's two types of people in the world, right? There's people that are already humbled and the people that are about to be humbled. Mm-hmm. And it's like you kind of either have to humble yourself or you have to be humbled by life and knock down a couple of times before you start to see that hmm, maybe my way isn't the right way. You know, maybe I don't know everything. Maybe this, maybe I can learn from this person. Maybe I should just try, try to listen. Right. Or maybe it's a, you know, something that just resonates on a, on a very deep level with somebody that they just decide to wake up and they're like, okay, maybe I should, you know, try something new. But it's like, I, I, my advice really is just to try to remain a student as much as possible. You know, it's like, if you're not reading Right. I'm I'm talking about like at all. If you're not reading at all, you have no advantage or benefit over somebody who can't read at all. If you choose not to read, it's like having it's not it's like having the ability to not read. Yeah. I I said it's a skill set you're not using. Yeah. Exactly. And it's like if you can humble yourself enough to start to read on a daily basis, whether it's just a page to start with. Or whether it's 10 minutes or whether 50 pages, 100 pages, whatever it is that you're comfortable with, if you just humble yourself enough to read on a daily basis, I guarantee you within the first couple of days, you'll you'll realize alone just from reading that you don't know anything. It's like the one thing I know for sure is that I don't know shit. And that's right. the truth. And for me too. <laughs> and that is the straight up truth. I don't know anything, man. I'm, I'm on this journey called life and I'm enjoying it as much as I possibly can, but at the same time, I understand that knowledge is truly potential power. Applied is, knowledge, applied right. knowledge power. So let me ask you, what does patience come into this? 
So I have another mentor, Patrick Bet David, who has this quote. He always says to stay aggressively patient, right? Have patience in time to elapse and for events to kind of come forth in the manifestation and for things to play out the way they're supposed to play out, but continue to be aggressive on a daily basis, right? It's like uh, I have this kind of mindset hack. I call it the brick by brick mindset, right? I stole this from Will Smith. Will Smith has a story about when he was younger, his dad ripped down a brick wall outside of his business and he made Will Smith and his brother rebuild the brick wall. And he said in the story, I think he was doing an interview where he said, you know, the goal every single day wasn't to build the wall. The goal was to lay one brick as perfectly as we can lay it that day. And you do that time and time again, and you do that consistently, and soon you'll have a brick wall. And I think that, and also Jason Capital, he has a phrase called the Kaizen, the Kaizen method. I think it's a Japanese. It is. It was, it was. It was. No, it was Japanese. I actually, I'm versed in. I actually took courses in Kaizen, and um, it was actually made by Toyota. And yep. um, it, it, it's a beautiful method. It breaks down everything to the simplest widget you can imagine to tear everything apart just so you can see the gaps or or the lack of 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 a unity your process has. Exactly. Exactly. And kind of like how the Kaizen and the brick by brick mindset play out. It's like every single day you're presented with an opportunity. You can either become overwhelmed with the process of building a wall and not do anything and just kind of freak out and just wait and procrastinate, which I've done on multiple times. And I'm telling you right now, if you're in that point in your life, I'm telling you it's okay and not to beat yourself up about it. Right. But it's like every day you have an opportunity to lay a brick to to get one percent better, to get one step closer to your goals. Right. And that opportunity lies in that 24 hours that we each have. It's like, what are you doing to maximize that 24 hours? What are you doing to, you know, get closer to your goals? And this, again, ties back into Earl Nightingale's Strangest Secret. He he specifically outlines, outlines how to go about goal setting. Because if you don't have goals, it's like you're a ship that left the harbor that doesn't have any idea of where you're going, where anything is in front of you. It's like if you have no map, if you have no captain, if you have no crew, You have no idea where you're going. You're going to end up shipwrecked. You're going to end up in the middle of the worst hurricane storm possible. And you're going to you're going to flip over and you're going to drown in the ocean. But it's like if you have a goal, a very specific goal, you're very clear on where you want to go. You're clear on what you need to do to get there. You're going to leave the harbor and you're going to get straight to your destination. I think a lot of people people tend to create these vision boards, which I've done in the past, and they're great, but they tend not to really work on these steps to get to the goal. Again, the process building to get there. Like if you're going to buy a house, what what do you need to get, get there? One is going to be credit, two, you're going to have to find a real estate agent, and then maybe a loan officer. Like those little things from there, there, instead of saying, hey, house, and that's it. Um, do you find yourself every – before you became so enlightened, did you ever find yourself um, kind of just wanting to rush the process to get somewhere, but not really knowing how to get there? Absolutely. My patience, you know, for starters, I want to say, you know, thank you for the compliment of calling me enlightened. However, I feel like I'm nowhere close. However, you know, my patience has, has, has ne- hasn't been, you know, this, I don't even know the, the verbiage I'm looking for, but in the past, I'll say this in the past, you know, I think a lot of people, including myself struggle, struggle with what I like to call the shiny object syndrome. It's like you get involved with the task or you start to go down, you know, these paths that can get us closer to our goals. And then like a new opportunity or a new shiny object or something new will pop up and it'll distract us and it'll take away our attention. And then we start to go down that rabbit hole. And I'll just kind of use this as an example of like two businesses. Like let's say somebody starts like a t-shirt business and they feel like this is how they're going to make their millions. This is what they're passionate about. You know, you just bought a course on it. You started, 
learning all about how to start and scale a t-shirt business, right? And then all of a sudden you get an ad for how to trade Forex, right? Or how to invest in the stock market, right? And it's like, oh, that just caught your attention. Somebody's a good salesman and hits you with a fantastic ad that piqued your interest. Now all of a sudden there's another shiny object and it's like you start to go down that avenue, right? It's like patience is also understanding that once you make a decision, once you go down the path, it's like you have the wall in front of you, whether it's buying a house, whether it's scaling a business to a million dollars a month, whether it's having a perfect relationship with your significant other. That's the wall, right? That's the end goal. But all that wall can be disassembled, right? And it can be brought down into bricks, into little activities or tasks that need to be accomplished in order for the wall to be built. It's like when you when you have, you know, a, a house, you, you, one of the bricks could be speak to a loan officer or get approved for a loan. Right. Or, you know, find your dream house or whatever. Right. All of those that wall can be broken down into bricks. And it's like when you kind of have those simple tasks, those simple bricks that you can lay on a daily basis. And in your mind, you can start to like actively you're winning the day. Andy Frisella has a great. Absolutely. Quote. He talks about winning the day, right? Mm -hmm. Like win the day, he has what he calls the power list, where he lists five things that he must do in order to win that day. And after you have something on your list for 21 days straight, it becomes a habit. It can be Absolutely. removed off the list and replaced with something else. And it's like that little, that little process, right, of getting a calendar or whatever and then kind of marking throughout your day, like what you've done to win that day. And then you actually get to like mark on your calendar as a win or as that brick is being laid. Like I laid this brick today. I laid this brick today. I laid this brick today. And then like after a month, you know, you see, oh my gosh, I just won every day for the last two weeks. You feel good, right? We talked about self-image, self-confidence, right? Ed Milet has a great quote. The best way to build self-confidence is by keeping the promises you make to yourself. So as you set out for that initial goal, that initial realization of a worthy ideal, right? As you go about keeping those promises that you make to yourself, you're going to build self-confidence. You're going to build self-esteem. You're going to build momentum. And just Absolutely. like any other plane out there, the plane cannot take off unless it has a certain amount of momentum under its wings. And then it takes flight. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh what I do myself is at the end of the month, I have a journal every day. I write in a journal exactly what I accomplished for that day or I didn't accomplish. What I do is I take inventory uh, and audit myself that month and say, Hey, 21 days, 70 days or whatever, how many days it was, you did X, Y, Z. Great. You keep on this path or you was a lazy motherfucker this past 30 days <laughs> and you did, you did 16 days of shit. <laughs> um, yep. and you're just dicking around. Um, you need to, reevaluate your goals uh, for next month and and figure something out and it, it just shows you on paper that you did shit or you did something so so great like oh man i see progression and you have that tangible thing to look at and that's what and, and again it's yeah it's a little bit of an extra task to to do but there's always time you know people don't know how to grab their time and they're so so called filled with life, and and they they, they fill their, their their day with so much crap. Um, they don't know how to use their time wisely. And and to your point with the kaizen model of breaking down their day, finding out where the fat is, extracting the fat, and find all the time they really need to be successful. Exactly. And I think I love that word you used, audit. You audit your month. You audit your day. I've started getting in the habit recently of just reflecting on my day, kind of writing down what time I woke up, when I started to do certain activities, you know, what I ate, kind of anything that I think of is that's important Absolutely. or any major, major events that happened or any ideas that I had throughout the day or things like that. And, you know, it, it does take discipline to sit down on a nightly basis and go through your day and reflect. But let me tell you that one act of discipline can have so many benefits. A, because I've started to see that life kind of gives you lessons over and over again, repeated lessons until you're, you know, able to adapt, evolve and kind of overcome or you've learned the, the lesson that, that life is trying to give you, right? So it allows you to pick up on the patterns that life is throwing at throwing you at a faster clip. 
and you're able to evolve a little bit faster. And B, it's just good to have all that stuff on paper because you're going to get to see the growth. You're going to be documenting the journey. You know, I was listening to one of your old podcasts. I think this was back in 2017 where you were talking about um, how 2018 is going to be your year and how you said you wanted to write a book. Yes, I wrote two books. (laughs) Exactly. So I want to say, A, congratulations for that. I think that's a huge accomplishment. Thank you. And, you know, B, I don't think you would have been able to do that without discipline. Yes. Right? And the simple act of disciplining yourself to even sit down and journal your day every single day, that discipline is going to trickle into other areas of your life. That discipline is now going to allow you to take a cold shower every single day, even though you don't feel like doing it, or meditate, or read, yeah. right? As soon as you start to introduce discipline into your life, it can, it can and has, and it has a, you know, uh, it, it, it will trickle over into other areas of your life. So I'm like that, I'm that discipline, I'm sure helped you write your book. It's like, I'm trying to write a book and I find it very hard for me to sit down on a daily oh. basis and write down. It's Remind. difficult as fuck. I, I made sure that myself, I set down time and I said, you know what, I'm gonna give you two hours a day to sit down and write something, whether it's comes up as just a fucking sentence or a paragraph exactly. or no matter what it is, within this time, you have to write something. And well, it, w- it was okay that I wrote down a word some days because I was like, I had I had that write, writer's block. And then other days I wrote pages, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it just depends, but you have to just make yourself do something for that project every single day. Exactly. Exactly. If we always do the things that need to be done on the days that we feel like doing them, we'd rarely get anything done. Absolutely. It's like, you know, everybody wants to be a YouTube star right nowadays. <laughs> And um, I've actually had a lot of people ask me, how come I'm not on YouTube? And I would say, well, one, I'm, I'm kind of traditional. I think a, a podcast for me, I think people can can multitask with a proper podcast, right? You can just listen to it, put, put your headphones on. You can clean your car. You can clean your house. You know, you can do whatever you want to do. You know, you, and um, we can be no more mobile. Am I going to go YouTube one day? Yes. I, I'll have some live guests coming up, you know, and that's my goal towards the end of the year. But my main goal is to really just get this interviewing down pat. Get, you know, get the right guests first. You know, get to really learn my craft before. And I, I'm not going to be good, at, some, at least for me, until I hit 1,000 episodes. That's when I know that I've had enough repetition to say, you know what? Yeah, I now I can say I'll give a master class in this. Right now, oh, I'm just being a fucking student. I'm just, I'm just not even, t- I'm not even tapping into my potential yet with this. Well, you know? I, I want to touch on that really quick. I'm sorry for interrupting you. No, no, I you're just good. want to, I just want to point out a, a fact. You said you, you, you don't think you'll get this down until a thousand episodes, right? Yeah. Now, Robert Green, a famous author, he's got a book called Mastery, and he basically lays out the, the uh, introduction that in order to achieve mastery in any subject. You must put in 10,000 hours. Okay. Now, if you put out a thousand episodes and every episode is 10 minutes or more, after a thousand episodes, you will have hit 10,000 hours, right? Is that right? Yeah. 10. Yeah. No, no, no. 10 Mm -hmm. minutes. Wait a second. I'm doing my math wrong. If, oh, wait. If every episode is, oh, shoot. I did my math way wrong there, guys. Again, I told you guys I was not good at school. But anyways, what I wanted to say is that I that, that that's a very good point that you're making right there. It's like you're putting in the hours, and as you put in more and more hours, you're gonna get better at your craft, right? right? And as you get better, you know it's gonna it's gonna ha- there there's gonna be new opportunities that come with that. You know, if you look at the highest paid professionals in any industry, they get paid because they are irreplaceable. Yes. They are that's they are the best at what they do. And they got that way by putting in hours and hours and hours in their craft and not giving up. That's it. It's like, and that, that breaks down into a daily, daily habits. That's literally the brick by brick mindset. If you want to look at any Olympic athlete, it's like they didn't just wake up one day and decided to go do the Olympics and become a gold medalist. No. They were training since they were like three years old. You look at Michael Phelps, he's been in the pool Every single day, seven days a week, you know, for yes. 10 years before yes. he, went, he went to his first Olympics. You know, it was like un, it's it it unparalleled work ethic. And I'm not saying that you have to start there. What I'm saying is just to start. 
It's like the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. Exactly. You can make a change in your life by starting today. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to be you have to start to be great. And people have to let go of the past and and not dwindle on it. You know, it, it's the past for a reason. And you can you can do the math all day of what could have happened or what if, but you can't live in that that realm of what ifs. You just can't. That would stagnate you and stop you all day fucking long. Exactly. Yeah, and that comes with forgiveness of our past too. You know, sometimes I think a lot of the times what stops us from moving forward is, you know, um, fear of failure or fear of rejection or fear of, you know, a lot of things that are just, you know, fictitious. You know, fear stands for false evidence appearing real, you know. And there's another uh, acronym for fear. It says face everything and rise. I like that. Right. And it's like fear is non-existent and fear, you know, does prevent us from going forward. It's like, why do I not approach that pretty girl in the gym? Right. It's because I'm afraid that she's going to reject me and I'm going to be embarrassed. But at, at the end of the day, like that fear, that that future that I'm projecting, it's not real. It's like until I go up and talk to that girl, I don't know what's real and what's not. It's like that situation is just left in the quantum soup of possibilities because I didn't act on it because I was fearful. Yeah, you just you had that much self doubt about yourself. You already exactly. shot yourself down. Exactly. So I think forgiveness is very crucial in that aspect of, you know, taking those opportunities and making quantum leaps forward. We have to forgive ourselves for our past mishaps, our past failures, our past, you know, um, yeah, our past troubles. So I think forgiveness plays a key role in that as well. No, it does. So that it's, it's go, going forward, what do you have coming up for you right now? What's going on for you right now? Right now. So great question. So I just recently started a podcast called A Beautiful Obsession. Uh, not a lot has been happening with that. I had a couple episodes that I recorded that the audio was a little bit messed up with, and I was trying to do some uh, re-recording of those episodes. So hopefully, um, if it's okay with you, Johnny, I would love to put this episode up on my podcast because I think that it's been a very good absolutely uh, conversation that we've had. You've done a fantastic job of kind of asking questions. I would also like to have you on as a guest possibly in the future. Oh, I'd be um, honored to. to, interview I'd be honored you to. Because I know you, you You probably know a lot about me right now. <laughs> I would like to get to know you a little bit better as well. So Sure. So we can talk about that moving forward. Also, I have a book that I'm writing called A Beautiful Obsession, Changing the, Changing the Paradigm of Addiction. That's a big calling that I have in my life, something I'm very passionate about, kind of getting out all of this, this kind of conglomerate of information that I've picked up over the years of studying successful entrepreneurs and, and kind of with my studies with spiritual practices and stuff like that. I just want to kind of get it all out into a book and uh, release that to the public. I also, um, I would like to be on stage here sometime soon within the next couple months, whether it's at a rehab facility, standing at a podium, helping the people that are, you know, going through rehab currently, or on a stage, you know, inspiring young entrepreneurs on how to develop a better mindset, right? Right. As of, as of right now, I'm just um, taking it day by day, uh, continuing to try to get better every single day, continuing to focus on the daily bricks that I can lay to improve, you know, all aspects of my life, that being spiritual, mental, physical, and financial as well, as well as just, you know, continue to be there as a father for my beautiful young daughter. And I have a couple projects that I'll be working on, uh, but it, for the most part, it's just get the book out as soon as possible. That's been like the biggest thing right now. And then just kind of continue to develop uh, my craft a little bit with investing and work on financial abundance. And yeah, we'll just see where the year takes us. I'm very much, I, I love the spiritual practice of preached, preached by the Tao, the Taoism community. Yes. Just kind of going with the flow, kind of understanding there's like this universal stream of abundance. And instead of like resisting it or going against it, just kind of let it flow throughout my life. Just kind of very taking it easy, but aggressively in the same sense. You know, it's like I'm taking it like aggressively patient, just kind of going about life, doing things as they come up, um, you know, handling stuff that I need to get done. And then just capitalizing on opportunities that are presented in front of me, even if I'm not necessarily 100% ready, 
I'll get ready. Oh, you understand. I, 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 I told you I'd get that. When I started the podcast and I didn't have guests at first, and I was like, well, I got to get guests on. Uh, how do I do that? <laughs> and um, I just started uh, kind of just going through Instagram, and I found some interesting people, and I DM'd them. And I was like, what I got to do is going to say no to me. <laughs> so I was like, uh, exactly. So I was like, screw it. And uh, did it. And I wasn't, I didn't even know how to record somebody over Skype. I, even, I, I didn't even, I wasn't even think about using Skype. And um, when I got my first person on, I was like, holy shit. It, it, it made me learn real quick what I needed to figure out. <laughs> exactly. That's, that goes back to the quote I was saying, like, Faith is taking the first step even when you can't see the entire staircase. Because after you took that first step, the second step appeared in front of you, right? It's like as soon as you started it, you understood all of a sudden, oh, this is what I need to do. This is how I can make the next step that much better. It was like a spotlight, an individual spotlight hit every step along the way. And it it was a beautiful thing because when I hit the landing, I noticed, hey, there's another staircase. Exactly. Yeah, the stairs never end. It's like – that's the yeah. be- that's the beautiful thing about life. It's like whatever level you're at right now, whatever level you're listening to this at right now, there's another level for you to get to. There's another awareness, uh, le- another conscious conscious awareness level for you to get to. Financial, mental, physical, spiritual, all of these are levels. Yes, and they all could be done, and that people need to understand that. And you're gonna you're gonna have to work on these all these different levels at the same time, but at different volumes. And and you're going to have to just educate yourself and you're going to have to probably knock some people out of your circle. And then most of the time it's friends and family. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to disown them, but they're going to have to be at the outer layer of your onion. Exactly. And and really get some more people, network more. There's a lot of groups on Facebook and things like that, or even just following other folks that's uh, similar to you on Instagram. You have to use social media for what it's really supposed to be made for, not for just for the drama and or the hype. If you really just go past that, past the fog, I like to call it, that's social media fog, you're going to get to the root of what exactly social media was made for. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be a, a huge social networking piece that's what it's called social for the first word right mm-hmm. so by doing that you'll win every time you get to, to meet people and you you know you, you just get to learn so much and say wow this is a different world a lot of people are in small towns you know a lot of people are not always in the big city and sometimes they feel trapped and sometimes people in the big city want to get the fuck out too and they feel trapped exactly and by you connecting with other people and saying hey you know what there are other people like me. There's 7 billion people on this planet. You're going to connect with somebody, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just by numbers. You are, you know, exactly. if, if, if my podcast or if my I, I, Instagram hits 5,000 folks, but I'm active with 3,000 people, I already won. Uh-huh. Cause most people who have a hundred thousand folks are not active. They just got a bunch of dead people following them and that's uh-huh. it. Yeah. And your whole your whole thing you want to go after is having interaction with folks, true engagements, true honesty, and just the truth. Period. Once you have those things, your success is not going to dwindle. It's going to just keep on going. But when you hit on earlier about gifting, if you notice all these entrepreneurs, your your um uh, Bill Gates of the world, you know where he he is giving, uh, trying to give away all his money. You know what I'm saying? With, with his foundation, with his wife. Uh-huh. And it's it's an amazing thing to see where, you know what? Been there, done that. I have all this money. I can't take it to me when I, when, when I die. <laughs> you, you can't take it with you when you die. So Exactly. The whole thing of gifting, it don't need to be super rich. It could just be your time somewhere. Like you said, if, if you do have a halfway house or, 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 or a congregation you can volunteer at, do so. Find out what you can do for yourself and f- to fill your soul at this point because once you fill your soul like you said man a lot of things will change for you in the right way exactly couldn't have said it better man i think we're gonna probably end it with that <laughs> that's a good way to end it <laughs> man clint I-, I have to thank you so much this has been a great conversation man it really has thank you again for having me on it's been a uh a- a pleasure speaking with you, man. You've asked some incredible questions. You brought out uh, a lot of nuggets that I think the, the audience can definitely, you know, take away from this episode. It's it's been a you know a great time, man. Thank you again for having me on. 
no, I, I appreciate what I'm going to do too. I'm, I'm put, kind of put Clint on the spot is that if you can se send me a list of all the books you mentioned and then some, so I could put it in the show notes so people can go ahead and start their education. I will absolutely do that. I have a wonderful library that, that grows by the day. So I can definitely give you a, a list of book recommendations that I would recommend to the audience that's listening. I can absolutely do that. And can you let everyone know how they, they can find you on your, all your social media platforms? Yeah, so my Instagram handle is a beautiful obsession, and there's underscores in between A and beautiful. So A underscore beautiful underscore obsession. So you can find me on Instagram at a beautiful obsession. Also, the website, a beautiful obsession.com is being built out right now. So hopefully by the time the audience is listening to this, it's fully built out. That's where I'm going to have a lot more of my content. I will be starting a YouTube channel here shortly, and a lot of my content will be on my website. But for now, those are the two main places that you can find me. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. That's fantastic. Hey, my lovely audience, I love you guys to death. This was Johnny Nomad Presents Beautiful Obsession. All right, Clint, take it easy, man. All right, Johnny. Thanks again.